The McDonnell Douglas F4 Phantom and the Vault F8 Crusader are an iconic duo. Both built initially for the US Navy and intended to complement each other. The F8 served as an agile day fighter, while the F4 acted as a long-range interceptor for knocking down Soviet nuclear bombers attacking the fleet. Both aircraft carved themselves a place in aviation history in the skies over Vietnam and would go on to see decades of service. But of the two designs, the Phantom was definitely the more successful. While the F-8 would establish a formidable reputation as a dogfighter, it ultimately only saw service with the US Navy, France and the Philippines. The Phantom however served with just about everyone the United States would allow to purchase it. Serving in fighter, bomber, reconnaissance and defence suppression roles, the F-4 was the plan that could get the job done. And quite often did, as its extensive combat record can attest. But when the F-4 began development in 1955, it was far from guaranteed that it would be the success it would become. In fact, given the amount of brand new technology the new aircraft was going to use, particularly the new J-79 turbojets, the US Navy was worried about putting all of its faith in this new aircraft. After all, Poorly performing jet engines had been something of a blight on a number of Navy fighters, curtailing several types' careers or even seeing them cancelled completely. So it was considered wise to have a backup, and Vault had a solution that almost perfectly fit the ticket. They were on the point of soon delivering their new F-8 Crusader day fighter to the US Navy and thought they could match the requirement for a new missile interceptor with a version of the F-8. Originally, this was given the company designation of V-401, but was soon more widely known as the Vault F-8U-3 Crusader III, or the Super Crusader. It received this designation because the Crusader 1 and 2 were versions of the F-8 that were on the point of entering service with the US Navy already. But despite the name and the selling point that it was based on the existing type, in fact, the Crusader III was a very different aircraft and shared few parts with its originator. Obviously, with a different mission profile as an all-weather interceptor, the III had a much larger and more sophisticated radar fit than its original forebear, with the original intention being for that to be the ANAPG-50, as was also planned for use on the F-4. To complement this, the Crusader III could carry three Sparrow III semi-active radar homing missiles, and Vault also made suggestions about combinations of Sparrows and Sidewinders. But the original quad of 20mm cannon were removed from the design, as, just as in the requirement that created the Phantom, they were considered redundant for the role of intercepting nuclear bombers attacking the fleet. The Sparrow armament was also slightly short of what the Navy wanted, which was for four missiles. But Vault justified the lesser armament on the grounds that with the guidance systems available, only one missile could be launched at a time. And with the expected speed of engagement, three missiles was sufficient. Because of the new radar fit, the nose needed to be adjusted to carry it, which further meant a new air intake. This was a divertless supersonic inlet design, DSI for short, which with its distinctive forward sweep gave the 3 its gate-mouthed look. This type of inlet, which is quite common on modern designs today, was specially designed to both be as simple a solution as possible, while managing the localised shockwave caused by supersonic travel and enabling the aircraft's engine to gulp the vast quantities of air it required at high Mach and the Crusader III certainly needed it. Because the Navy wanted a backup in the event of failure of the J-79 on the Phantom, Vault had to use a different engine. They chose the Pratt & Whitney J-75P-5A. This was a development of the J-57 that powered the original F-8 fighters. But in contrast to that, the J-75 produced a dry thrust of 16,500 pounds of force in comparison to the J-57's 11,500 pounds. But with Afterburner, the J-57 only produced around 18,000 pounds of force, whereas the J-75 on the Crusader III put out 29,500 pounds of force. 
The Crusader III needed this because though it was only slightly larger than the original F8, it was much heavier, with gross weight being 46% more in the three due to the extra equipment it carried for its missile interceptor role. Aerodynamically, the Crusader III copied the F-8's unusual variable incidence wing for landing and takeoff, but it also included a couple of retractable ventral fins that deployed in flight to stabilise the aircraft at high Mach. They were needed because the three was fast. Really fast. In fact, Vault boasted that the aircraft would make Mach 2.79, and with development, they reckon it could top out closer to Mark III. That is almost certainly an exaggeration, as the Crusader was not designed to withstand temperatures generated at that speed. But once flight trials started in June 1958, the aircraft soon demonstrated that it was perfectly happy to hit Mark II, and achieved a top speed of Mark 2.39 without too many problems. And though intended to have a maximum altitude of 55,000 feet, it recorded a maximum in testing of 74,000. Acceleration was also apparently exceptional, with one test pilot recalling that he was once asked by ground control while conducting a test flight, Sir, just what the hell are you flying? Apparently the GCI couldn't believe the speed with which the aircraft had gone up to Mark II. Certainly the three outclassed other aircraft of the time, and F-104 chase planes that were used on the test flights, the type itself known for its fast speed and acceleration, consistently failed to keep up with the Crusader III. Vault also proposed fitting a rocket booster motor, and wanted to redesign the cockpit canopy and the leading edges for better heat resistance, so maybe Mark III wasn't completely out of the question after all, though it would have taken a considerable amount of extremely specialist engineering. And unlike its contemporaries like the F-100 or F-104, the Crusader III seems to have made few sacrifices in its all-round performance. Agility was reported to be inferior to the earlier Crusader types at lower speeds, understandable as the F-8 was built with dogfighting in mind. But the III was reportedly an excellent handling aircraft, especially in high-speed ranges. It also had good range, and the aforementioned F-104s in the testing program not only couldn't keep up with the prototypes, they also had to drop out for refueling and be replaced while the Crusader 3s carried on flying their tests. Of course, it wasn't all perfect. The J-75 engine had a nasty tendency for compressor stalls, and these were no small affair. One test pilot described it to being akin to the cockpit being hit by a 40mm Bofors shell, while another said it was like flying through the blast of your own 500 pound bomb during an attack run. This issue was never fully sorted out, though when the cause was identified as cutting the afterburner while exceeding the speed of sound, it could be somewhat mitigated. The other issue was in the single crew layout. The Navy had originally required that the fighter, like the F-4, have a two-man crew. This was because the Sparrow missile required dedicated guidance, and so the job of both flying the aircraft and guiding the missile in combat was considered too much for a single pilot. Vault did initially consider building the Crusader III as a two-seater, but recognised that their single engine, even one as powerful as a J-75, would put them at a disadvantage against the Phantom. After all, although the F-4 was heavier than the Crusader III, and its individual J-79s were less powerful than the J-75, the Phantom had two of them, giving it an extra 4,000 pounds of force in afterburner. By cutting the second crewman, the Crusader III could outperform the F-4, but that left the problem of how to guide the missiles. So Vault developed an interesting dual control system that meant that the pilot had two control columns, one to control the aircraft, one to control the radar which guided the missiles. The company was also able to utilise their experience with the Regulus cruise missile to provide the Crusader III with an autopilot, the intention being that during an engagement, the pilot could switch this on and concentrate on using his radar. The record on this setup is mixed, with some sources saying that it was easy to use, while others say it overloaded the pilot. But there was no denying that the Crusader III had a lot going for it. In fact, the potential of the aircraft meant that consideration was given by the British to buying the Crusader III, but fitted with a Conway turbofan engine. 
And it was so well regarded that in the words of George Spangenberg, head of aircraft design at the United States Navy's Naval Air Systems Command, it was, quote, the best fighter never produced. Now, there are quite a few aircraft with that claim, but seeing as Spangenberg played a major role in seeing into service the F-4 Phantom, the F-14 Tomcat, the F-18 Hornet, the P-3 Orion, actually, the list goes on and on, but you get the point. If even one of the main people responsible for choosing the US Navy's aircraft at the time said that about the Crusader III, but it still didn't get selected for production, losing to the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom, then you have to wonder just what happened. What went wrong, and why did the F-8U-3 not get into service? After all, the Crusader III was cheaper than the Phantom, had better performance, and used 20% less deck space, a critical consideration in carrier aircraft. But the F-4 won out. In a number of sources, you will find the accusation that the Navy had already made up their mind before the competition between the F-4 Phantom and the Crusader III got started. That does make some sense. After all, the F-4 was the aircraft that the Navy had wanted originally. It met their full stated specification of two crew and four Sparrow missiles, and the F-8U-3 was intended to be the backup in the event of the failure of the Phantom anyway. But in fact, it seems a little more complicated than all that. Because it seems that had things been different, the Navy would have happily adopted both aircraft. However, in 1957, Congress mandated that the US Navy would only have one aircraft for the role of long-range air defence, with spending needs precluding two types in service performing the same role. And this led to much hand-wringing at the Navy Selection Board as they tried to decide which aircraft they would select. But at the end of the day, the limitations of the radar guidance system of the era meant that, by what looks like the slimmest of margins, the F-4 Phantom won the competition in December 1958. As Spangenberg ultimately concluded, the greater effectiveness of the two-seat aircraft in adverse conditions is decisive. That wasn't quite the end of the Crusader III, however. In 1959, Vault pitched the aircraft to the Air Force as an alternative to the F-106, and then to Canada with the cancellation of their own Avro Arrow interceptor. But neither of these parties were interested, and so only five Crusader III's were ultimately built. A couple of these were then loaned to NASA for conducting experiments in high-speed flight and supersonic boom research. This has led to legends of these aircraft flying off against phantoms in mock fights and, quite frankly, kicking their butts. But this seems to be a bit of a myth, though I do suspect that the Crusader III was quite capable of handling a phantom in such a scrap. Alas, their time with NASA was brief, and once concluded, all of the aircraft ultimately, and rather tragically, ended up being scrapped. The decision to choose the Phantom over the Crusader III will probably always cause argument amongst aviation fans. As a pure fighter, I think it is fair to conclude that the Crusader III was the better aircraft. Indeed, it is possible that it would have been a better choice for the sort of combat that the Phantom found itself in over Vietnam, where the ability to use long-range missiles was largely denied, and it often came to close-quarters fighting, something the Phantom really wasn't designed for. But to counter that, it is hard to imagine that the Crusader III would have proven as capable as the F-4 as an all-rounder, eventually performing a host of roles that it was not originally intended for. As said, it is a discussion that I suspect will never be resolved fully, and I look forward to reading your opinions in the comments. And if you want to know more about the Crusader III, there are some excellent sources available. Firstly, Tommy Thomason's book is basically the definitive text on the entire aircraft development program, covering every facet of it. Secondly, one of the test pilots who flew the three, Donald Malik, has an entire chapter on his experience with the aircraft in his memoir, which is available for free download on the NASA website. I'll put a link to both in the description and also to the Military Matters website, where you can find other sources on the Crusader III. Happy holidays everyone, enjoy yourselves, and I will catch you all again soon.